Hello, everyone that's joining us. We are glad to have you. It's an exciting time of the year and special opportunities with family and friends and many blessings to celebrate and on the brink of 2021. Hard to believe it's just about here. So God be with you and all those in your circle of family and friends. And may the Lord help us all to draw closer to him as we reflect on where we've been and look forward to what's coming ahead. I'm hearing from some of you regarding 2020 hindsight as we have learned so much from our ups and downs this year. But God has been faithful and true. He has never left us. He never will. And we found even greater strength in his presence and his spirit and his word, perhaps, than ever before. In this series, Christianity 101, we're talking about those basic elements of our faith. And in this particular quarter, we're concentrating on what we do, that is, those avenues or aspects or expressions of worship. We spent the last two sessions talking about worship's uh, its nature and its significance, and we went to Isaiah 6 and then Revelation 4 and 5. Now we're going to start looking at hearing the Word of God as one way that we worship Him when we assemble together. Then we'll talk in a couple of weeks about praying and about the Lord's Supper and about giving, and we'll consider, and singing, uh, we'll consider each of these prayer. We'll have uh, at least two sessions on each uh, part of our worship when we come together as the church. There are those things that the New Testament authorizes us to do, and in our desire to identify with God's plan and God's pattern, not to add or subtract or minimize or veer from the path, we are confident that when we do the things the Word of God tells us to do, we are obedient to His will and walking in His light. And so if you're with us uh, on Facebook, if you'll go ahead and leave a comment and say hello. If you'd like to share this lesson with others, you may do so on your personal page. And I'll give you in just a moment an email address where you may get in touch with a question or an additional scripture. If you'd like to have the PowerPoint file or notes that may be available, we'll be glad to share them with you. All of these lessons are posted on my YouTube channel as well as on the church Facebook page. And so we want those resources to be available for you uh, at any time you would, you would like to have them. So tonight, as we talk about what we do in worship and especially receiving God's word as an action, as something in which we engage to honor the Lord, to praise the Lord, to serve the Lord in our worship assembly, particularly, it's so important that we understand that when God's message is proclaimed, you and I choose to receive it. And it's so vital that we open our hearts and our lives to the things in God's word. Jesus said in Matthew 13 that a farmer, a sower, went out to scatter seed, and some of it fell on different types of surfaces and different thicknesses of soil. And that fourth soil, what did it do? It received the seed, which was God's word, and took it in and grew and produced 30, 60, and 100 times that which was planted. He told another parable in Matthew 13 about a field in which after the farmer planted wheat, his enemy came in secretly and planted weeds, darnel or tares, plants that look like wheat but wouldn't produce any fruit. And they mingled with the genuine grain and it became a dilemma. And Jesus said that at the final judgment, there would be a great harvesting and a separating of the wheat from the weeds. 
So I've used the image this evening of a sponge because I like to think about absorbing, soaking in uh, God's truth. I like to think of putting myself in the word of God so that I'm in the word and the word is in me. And then after my time of meditation and reflection and study and praising God by hearing the words of the Bible, then I am that sponge that is so full of what God has said that it squeezes out in every relationship and every uh, encounter in every situation, even every challenge or problem that we face. And because as a sponge, you and I are full of the scriptures, other stuff can't get in there and fill us up because we're already saturated. So we're going to talk tonight about receiving God's word as an act of worship and how important it is that we do so. John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the word. Makes you think of Genesis, but then bringing it over to the word becoming flesh. Jesus, the Christ. Jesus is the living word of God. He is the word of God breathing and moving and talking and acting. And so it all blends together to learn about Jesus is to learn the word of God. To dig into the word of God is to learn about Jesus. He who was from the very beginning. So nothing can compare with God's word. I'll say several times during this session, there is no substitute. There is nothing that can be put alongside of this message from heaven and even hold a candle to it from the very beginning when God spoke let there be light he brought light into the universe he had made and that light then would be shining even in the darkness and through Jesus Christ and his coming and his ministry his death and his resurrection and his ascension and so it's exciting. It's thrilling. Can you imagine if you never had the Bible and someone told you there is a God in heaven and he has spoken and he has recorded through individuals that he used. He has recorded that which will give you life and hope and victory. It will diagnose your problems. It will provide the cure, the antidote. It will direct you and and take you where uh, God wants you to be into the best possible way of walking with him and honoring him. And so it's so important that we understand that hearing the word of God is an act of worship. Open your Bible with me now to Psalm 19. There are two parts to this passage. First is God's world. The heavens declare the glory of God and so forth. And then the second part is God's word. And here we find the things that God has spoken described in various terms and explained as to the character of what God has spoken and the effect in our lives. Psalm 19, 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Here you can see First, you have the content and then the source, the quality, and the effect. What do we mean by the content? Look at verse 7, the law, the testimony. Verse 8, the precepts, the commandment. Verse 9, the fear, the rules. And then 
the power is in its origin. It is the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, and so forth. Is, and then you have perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, true. And the effect of that, reviving the soul, making wise the simple, rejoicing the heart, enlightening the eyes, enduring forever. And then in verse 11, you find the warning of danger and the promise of reward. The Bible is something of a treasure map. And if we will follow it, though we're imperfect, we are faithful and we seek to be where God wants us to be and to carry out the things that he has taught us, then there's a blessing to come. Great, great, great reward available no other way. And also the warning, the, the stop sign, the flashing light that says, don't change, turn back, turn around. Then in verses 12 to 14, the result of engaging the Lord in his word, worshiping him by receiving his word, is that we examine ourselves and we pray. And again, we worship God. Look at verse 12. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. That is, there are sins in my life that are not on the surface, that are not always visible even to me. So when I come to the word of God, I ask God to declare me innocent and help me repent of those things presumptuous sins, verse 13, where I might cross the boundary, and God said, don't go any further, and I transgress, and then uh, blameless and innocent, that's the prayer, then the worship, verse 14, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart may be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. You can see, as I do, that hearing and taking in and absorbing like a sponge the word of God is an act of worship. It's important for us to understand this because sometimes people may question. They'll say, well, I see that singing and prayer and the Lord's Supper and giving are acts of worship. But how is preaching? an act of worship in the way that these others are? Well, not exactly in the same way, but if you think not just about preaching as an act of worship, but receiving the message that is preached. So when I stand up and others do, and we proclaim the majestic message of heaven, in a sense, I'm certainly worshiping God. I'm giving him praise and thanks. I'm adoring him and honoring him. But whatever may be the case, as I hear the word of God, even as a preacher, as you hear the word of God, as you seek to, to fill your heart and your life uh, and your, your passion with those things that God has for all of us, that we might be more like Christ by knowing Christ, that we might pray more effectively by learning about prayer, that we might serve uh, in ways that please God. And so Psalm 19 makes this clear that when I realize the word of God is more to be desired than, than gold, even much fine gold, it's sweeter than honey or anything else that might be pleasant to the taste, it warns me of danger it promises me a reward. It exposes and helps me reject uh, both secret sins that may be undercover and presumptuous, pushy, defiant sins that could destroy you and me. And then it leads to this prayer that our words and our meditation might be acceptable to God. So receiving the word of God is an act of of worship because it is God's word. And as a result, it is that which is pure. It's right. It's true. It enlightens the heart. It rejoices 
uh, our soul and so forth. Enlightens the eyes, I should say, and rejoices the heart. Let's think now about Jesus who came preaching. After his baptism in Matthew 3 and his overcoming Satan's temptations in Matthew 4, we find he starts his ministry in Galilee, the northern part of Israel, where the Old Testament tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali uh, had lived. And uh, the darkness that Jesus brought light to dispel that darkness. Now, how did he do it? Look in your Bible at verse 17 of this passage. From that time, Jesus began to preach. Jesus proclaimed the word of God. Now, you can see in this that people receiving what he said would be worshiping God. If they repent as God tells them to, they do that in obedience to God. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand and you want to be part of it. So make the changes that God requires. In Mark chapter 1, 38, Jesus would move from town to town. Why? So that I might preach there also, for that is what I came for. Jesus, what did you come for? I came to preach. Why? So people would hear the word of God. What would happen as a result of that? They would know God. They would love God. They would serve God. Jesus preaching declared and applied the word. His miracles confirmed and illustrated the word. So when you see, for example, he was casting out demons here in verse 39 and also teaching in their synagogues, these work together so that he demonstrated his identity and his authority through these signs. And that gave credence and credibility to the words that he spoke. Now, if you go back to Matthew chapter 5, you know very well when Jesus went up on that mountainside and sat down and his disciples came to him, he started teaching. Now, let's say right here, there's an extremely close connection between preaching and teaching. If you were to try to define the two in a way that shows their similarity, but also their differences, you might find it uh, not an easy task. Preaching and teaching both have the content of the Word of God. Both have the purpose of helping people understand who God is and what he authorizes and what he provides and what he blesses and what direction he would lead all those that follow him. Sometimes in our teaching, we're more interactive, more of a dialogue. This class would be an interactive discussion if not for the current circumstances we face. Preaching we see as more of a monologue. Preaching may be structured with an introduction and a primary body of several main points and then a conclusion and an invitation. But isn't that also the aim of teaching? So when Jesus goes up on the mountain, we say he went up to teach, but we understand he is presenting the word of God. And then for example, he would take a passage like, you shall not commit murder, and he would explain to the crowd what he was instructing them uh, as to the significance. I say to you, and he then uh, exposes the idea that murder is a result of anger and that the real issue is in the heart before it comes to the hand. And you know how he went through uh, such things as, as murder and anger and uh, adultery and lust. And he talked about keeping your promises and being faithful to your marriage. And 
in, in these cases, he's taking something from the scriptures and he is bringing them to light. He's illuminating the things that God has said. That's what preaching is. And it's a part of worship because then those who hear have a choice as to how they will respond. Now turn to Luke chapter 4, starting at verse 16. As Jesus went through these various synagogues, he came to Nazareth, where he had grown up to manhood, and it was the Sabbath. He stood up to read. He was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled it, and he found what we call Isaiah 61. And there he read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. Excuse me, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant. He sat down. All the people in the synagogue were staring at him. What would he say about this passage regarding the anointed one, which is the same as the Messiah or the Christ? How would he interpret it? What would he draw from that passage? When Jesus said, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing, he was declaring, in effect, I am the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. You can see how many of them then turned against him because they would not accept the truth that he presented to them. So here we see what preaching is, and we also see that every time the Word of God is presented, there is a request, I'm sorry, there is a response that people make, a response. And then look at the word proclaim. I found it three times. What did Jesus come to do? Why was he anointed as the Christ, the Messiah? Well, because the poor need good news. The captives crave liberty. The blind are desperate for sight. And those oppressed would be thrilled to find relief. Those in sin, hungering for God's favor. And so Jesus read, as, the Isaiah, as Isaiah had preached over 700 years earlier, this is what the promised one would do. This is the purpose of preaching, to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That brings us then to what we see in the church. Just like with Jesus, as he's talking about the kingdom, it's at hand. It's about to begin in its earthly phase, God's dominion, God's rule. That would be the church. And so in Acts chapter 2, the apostles uh, proclaim that Jesus, who was crucified, has been raised from the dead. He's been exalted to the right hand of the Father above, and he's poured out all these special events, the speaking in tongues and so forth in Acts 2. And as we've already studied last quarter, they repented, they were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, and the Bible says they were added to each other. That was the first congregation. Uh, these were followers of Christ, and that's who we seek to be in the Lord's church, simply Christians, his disciples, his followers. Well, what happens next after these several thousand respond to the gospel? 
they gave themselves wholeheartedly to four specific elements. And the first of the four is the apostles' teaching. If you want to call it teaching, you want to call it preaching, we've already seen the corollary and similarity between the two. When the apostles would stand up in front of the church in Jerusalem and thus says the Lord, and this is what it means, and this is what we are to do, the people responding faithfully would have been worshiping God in that way. Of course, here you also have the fellowship, the sharing of their lives, the breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper, which we'll discuss in a couple of future lessons, and prayer that we will cover as well. Just want us to see here that preaching occupied a central primary spot in the coming together of the church. And so in Acts 20 and verse 7, we will focus on this again with the Lord's Supper, the breaking of bread we saw in chapter 242. Here it is again. When? The first day of the week. What happened? Well, we gathered together to break the bread. We understand that to be the communion, the Lord's Supper. Paul began talking to them, and he prolonged his message until midnight. Paul was preaching, and they were gathered there. You remember that Eutychus fell asleep and was taken up alive. And we who preach like to say that Paul prolonged his message. <laughs> he, uh, he did not give them a, a tidbit or a morsel. But he preached, and he preached, and he preached, even until midnight. We don't know what time he started. But if you had the opportunity, first of all, of course, to hear Jesus speak, you'd never want him to stop. Or if it were one of the apostles that had known Jesus, or Paul who had met Jesus on the road to Damascus, what a delight that would be. If we could convey the idea that when someone stands up and tells us what Jesus said, that's as close as we get to hearing Jesus speak to us. In that same chapter, later talking to a group of elders from Ephesus, Paul notes teaching in public and from house to house. When he wrote to Timothy, he emphasized the reading of Scripture, and some versions say the public reading of Scripture, because you can see in the verse exhortation and teaching. This has to do with the time that the saints would come together, especially on the first day of the week. What do you want to be sure to have in that worship? Reading of Scripture exhortation, which is let's do this, urging, spurring one another on, important part of preaching. It's the so what. It's the application. And then in verse 16, persevere in these things. As you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and those who hear you. Why do preachers preach? In order to save others through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Preachers doesn't save anybody in his own strength, but when the Bible says you'll ensure salvation, it's because the preacher is a conduit. We talked about all of us being sponges, soaking it in, uh, overflowing just the slightest movement, and it, it oozes out because we're full of God's word. But now think about also uh, the preacher as a, as a mouthpiece declaring the word of the Lord. But notice also the preacher will ensure salvation for himself. One reason that preachers love to preach, and I'll say this for myself, is I want to walk faithfully with the Lord. And preaching helps me at least as much as it does anyone else who may be listening. 
Uh, preaching is a, is a tremendous tool for helping yourself to, uh, to, to stay on the right path in, in, God's, uh, in God's will. So notice uh, how Paul talked about preaching again here. I am eager to do what? Preach the gospel. He wanted to come to Rome, chapter 115. Why? I'm under obligation. I'm eager to preach. I am not ashamed, he would go on to say. First Corinthians chapter 1, here you had all of these Greeks with their sophistry and their rhetoric and their philosophy and their great thinking. No message from any other source than God himself is able to save. Why is preaching so infinitely and immeasurably powerful? Because in God's word is the only antidote, the only treatment, the only solution to man's problems. And preaching exposes the problems and then points men and women to the Christ. And so Paul said, as he wrote the Corinthians, the world and its wisdom did not know God. We, we couldn't find God by inventing our own strategy and our principles and our religion. We'd never get to God. God had to make himself known to man. And so we preach Christ crucified. The Jews may stumble because they're looking always for another sign, one more tangible, visible uh, proof or event or miracle. And the Greeks may stumble because it sounds like folly to them, and they might be so entrenched with uh, the Epicureans or the Stoics we read about in Acts 17, or with Socrates or Plato or Aristotle, that they would not consider that uh, some non-Greek message about a crucified Savior could actually give them eternal life. But you and I know that that's exactly what gives eternal life. And so Paul went on to write in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, I, I have to preach the gospel. Necessity is laid upon me. Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Every time the word of God is proclaimed, every time Jesus Christ is exalted and highlighted and displayed to those that are lost or weak or struggling or needy, there is the potential that out of that will come a conversion, a restoration, a closer walk with the Lord. And so the preacher never knows. And this is what the preacher loves about preaching, is that he never knows. One of our good brothers that we've known in the past, Basil Overton, used to say, the great thing about preaching is that you don't know what you're doing. And what he meant by that was not that you shouldn't prepare and give it your best and know your, your message. You know what you're doing in that way. But you don't know what is going to happen when you take that seed and you scatter it out there. Here I am telling you why I'm a preacher and why I often encourage young men and men of all ages to, to preach in some capacity, whatever the opportunity may be, because what is in that seed is life and deliverance and liberty. So turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4, and you know this passage well also. We could put 2 Timothy chapter 3 and chapter 4 together. I think I'll do that on a, another slide coming up here, but I'll go ahead and say that in 2 Timothy 3, if you overview that text, the apostle is writing to Timothy that 
in this last period of history, uh, difficult times would come. People would be lovers of self and lovers of money and lovers of pleasure and disobedient to parents and to God and so forth. But he says to Timothy, you, however, this is chapter three, you continue in the things in which you've been instructed and how from infancy you have known what? This is chapter three, the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. Timothy, don't go along with these false teachers, those who are straying from God's message, they're going to end up lost and in trouble, and their lives will be wasted. Every scripture is breathed out by God, chapter 316. It's profitable for teaching and reproof and correction and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Then chapter 4. Therefore, I charge you in the presence of God and the angels and, and Jesus who will judge the living and the dead and so forth. What's the charge? Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. One preacher said that means preach it when they like it and preach it when they don't. And Paul gives the reason. The time will come that men will have itching ears or They'll want to have their ears tickled, and they'll turn away from the truth to myths and things that suit their fancy and their appetite and their interest. If there's any scripture that we see fulfilled in living color before our very eyes today, it is this, that Man, if he finds the word of God blunt, correcting him, straightening him out, rebuke him, and no, oh, no, 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 no. Tell me just something light and easy. Give me some candy, some fluff. Give me something that will make me laugh and make my life go easier and better. Don't, don't. Bring this to me. It's, it, it calls on me to repent and to change and to obey God. And so all of the fads, all of the innovations, all of the trappings that man has added to make worship some sort of spectacle, some kind of entertainment, some concert or show or performance. I'll say it again and again and again. God said it through Paul, preach the word. The more man may resist it, the more determined we must be to present it. There is nothing more exciting, more relevant, more effective. There, nothing compares with the word of God. And for someone to think that somehow it's boring or something else needs to be added to it is to miss what we hold in our hands. And so 2 Timothy 4, a recognition that man can be this way, makes it even more vital that the preacher preaches the word. Verse 5, sober-minded, ready to endure suffering, doing the work of an evangelist and fulfilling his ministry. Sober, that is serious about this task, enduring suffering if he should be persecuted for it. An evangelist simply means a person that proclaims the gospel of Christ, to fulfill one's ministry. There is no substitute for preaching God's word. We cannot say it enough. We won't add to it. We won't take from it. 
we won't think we found something that's better or different or new because of who God is and because what we hear, what we receive is from his very mouth. <laughs> How many times Jesus said, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. We already mentioned Matthew 13, the sower scattering the seed. He used this phrase there in Matthew 13, 9. Previously in chapter 11, 15, when he talked about John the Baptist being the antitype or the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophet Elijah, he said, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. And then in Revelation, in all seven of those letters to churches, all seven, this very same phrase, how important it is. I read in Mark 12, 37, when Jesus was teaching that people listen to him with delight. In Matthew 15, there were some 4,000 men plus the women and children who went three days without food because Jesus was preaching. And how could you miss one word from Jesus Christ just because you're hungry? Three days without food, that seems like a long, long time. But you can understand there was something they were more hungry for than bread. In Luke 24, 32, you have the two disciples on the road to Emmaus saying, were not our hearts burning within us when Jesus opened up the scriptures to us? He that has ears to hear, let him hear. James, inspired to say, receive. That's this lesson. Receive with meekness the implanted word. There's that seed again, which is able to save your souls. The rest of this passage we'll consider later on. We talk about putting into practice God's word. But our focus this evening is on opening our ears, opening our hearts, opening our lives. Basically to say, Lord, whatever you have spoken, I want to know it. I want to take it. I want to soak it in like a sponge and I want to obey it. I mentioned Hebrews 5 because we don't want to be dull of hearing. You see that statement uh, in verse 11 of chapter 5. And as I used to tease our preaching students some in the university. I say, you know, sometimes the preacher is dull. Yeah, sometimes the preaching is dull. Let's, let's admit it. But there's also a dullness of hearing. <laughs> so in order for preaching and and faith, in order for it all to work, we need preaching that's not dull, and we need hearers that are not dull, but that are alert, that are on the edge of their seat, so to speak, that can't wait to hear what God has said, and then grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Second Peter 3, here's another warning that there will be some that will distort the scriptures. Since you know that, you stay with the word of God and you receive it and never let it go. There is no substitute. This is a picture of one of our young men taken several years ago at camp. And there at night with his headlamp on, God's word, a light to my feet. I treasure this picture and it encourages me. I always want to have that same spirit. I love this picture too. I don't know this little boy, but I found this image and I thought, there he is. All the things he could be doing, he could be getting into, he could be interested in. He's there with the word of God. I also want to mention to you that we've done a previous class on how to study the Bible. We called it Digging for Gold, and those lessons are published on this very same YouTube channel. Let us know if we can help you access those.
We're so glad that you've been with us. And if you've not done so, please on Facebook, go ahead and say hello. Let us know that you're part of our group on this occasion. And if you're inclined to do so, please share this on your own Facebook page. And then if you'll write me an email, solid.faith, solid.faith at outlook.com. I'll look forward to corresponding with you. Thank you again.